let us mop up the rest of the conditions around the hip and the questions that are asked if you get those cases the first is congenital dislocation of the hip also called as development dysplasia of the hip because here the acetabular roof is more shallow as compared to normal so what is your diagnosis congenital dislocation of the hip why do you say so in a neonate in all cases you should do an ortolani or a barlow test barlow means bahar low if you are can dislocate the hip by putting an anterior pressure on the head in a flexed hip that is called as bahar low barlow test and the opposite is the ortolani test that means under low so this examination in all neonates may make you diagnose the problem early may make you reduce it retain it and treat it with minimum interference in a older child the abduction external rotation would be restricted and if the child can walk you will get a trendelenburg gait which is lateral ipsilateral bending of the trunk on the weight bearing limb towards the side of the weight bearing limb if there is a bilateral congenital dislocation of hip this lat this lateral bending will become both sides it and that is called as the waddling gait if you are in doubt of a congenital dislocation of the hip you can do an x ray of the pelvis ap view and what you have to draw is the hilgener's line which connects the the articular cartilage of both acetabulum so this is the hilgener's line this one and then you draw the line which is parallel to the upper border of the acetabulum this line the normal angle which is called as the acetabular index or acetabular angle is about 25 to 30 degrees if it is more then the acetabulum is short, is shallow it will not be able to retain the hip and you will have to do something about this shallow acetabulum the second indication is that you draw the hilgener's line then you draw a perkins line this is the perkins line this one and this perkins line is a line which is perpendicular from the edge of the lateral edge of the acetabulum and thus there are four quadrants normally the head should lie in the lower medial quadrant here but here it comes to lie in the upper lateral quadrant so this movement of the head from here to here is diagnostic of congenital dislocation of the hip so if in a neonate you do not see the ossific nucleus you can trace where the neck is going if it is going in the lower medial quadrant there is no dislocation if it is going in the upper lateral quadrant this line of the neck then there is a congenital dislocation of the hip so then we have already shown you this so draw a perkins line draw the hilgener's line which connects the both both the growth plates if the head is here here or the neck is pointing here it is dislocated if it is pointing here it is not dislocated secondly you draw this angle between the roof of the acetabulum between the roof of the acetabulum and the hilgener's line normally if it is 30 degrees less than 30 degrees there is no acetabular dysplasia if it is more than 30 degrees then you will have to do something about this acetabular dysplasia barlow test means barlow test ability to dislocate and push the head outwards posteriorly in a flex step 
Otolani is put it back in by pressure on the gluteal region. Treatment is reduce and retain by a broomstick plaster. If it is not reducible, you have to open reduce and retain it by a K wire. So you will have when you are open reducing it, you will have to deal with factors that prevent core close reduction. From outside in, they are shortened pelvi femoral muscles which don't permit a descent. This you can deal with by a subtrochantric osteotomy which shortens the femur and allows the upper part to come to the level of hesitabulum or by a skeletal traction. That's how you deal with pelvic contracture. Then hourglass contracture of capsule which means one part of the capsule is containing the head, the other part is in the acetabulum and in between the capsule has been pressed by the iliosos muscle. So there is the R glass contracture. Here you will have to release the iliosos and then there will be adequate pressage from the, to the head to come into the acetabulum. The third thing is the inverted labrum of the acetabulum. This labrum may be inverted. It may prevent the head from coming in the acetabulum. The fourth thing is a filled acetabulum or a shallow acetabulum. The sixth thing is a ligamentum teres, which is hypertrophic. So all these things you will have to deal with before you can open reduce. And then you will have to retain it by a pin. So, if you can't reduce, it's an old case, adult with a Trendelenburg gait, you do a pelvic support osteotomy, where the it is a valgus osteotomy done at the level of the ischial tuberosity, where the pelvic angle is equal to the angle of osteotomy. Here you can't do abduction or adduction or there is no progressive shortening because this can't go up. This has, the femur has fitted the pelvis, it can't go up. For acetabular dysplasia, acetabular dysplasia which is like this, you can do a Pemberton osteotomy. Pemberton osteotomy or a Chiari osteotomy or a Salter's osteotomy. We've already told you these three pelvic osteotomies. You can also, you see, this neck is more vertical than it should be. Normally, the neck shaft angle should be 52 degrees. So, what is the difference between the neck shaft angle here and 52 degrees? You can do an open wedge varus osteotomy so that the neck becomes uh, more uh, more correctly in the uh, valgus varus situation and the head comes into the acetabulum. So this is a subtrochantric varus osteotomy which restores the neck shaft angle to 52 degrees. Then we come to the posterior dislocation. Posterior dislocation is history of in dashboard injury with the hip adduct adducted. There's pain, swelling, deformity, loss of function around the hip. The vascular sign of Narat may be positive. There is a true shortening above the trochanter and apparent shortening is more than true shortening. So you, you do an x-ray. Prepare the patient for anesthesia and surgery and if the patient is in general anesthesia, you make him lie on the floor. You adduct and internally rotate the limb. You give counter traction by fixing the pelvis and traction like this. So as the head is now in the lowest portion of the acetabulum, you will be able to reduce it. After that, you abduct and externally rotate and extend. You immobilize in extension and abduction. 
for three to four weeks till the reduction becomes stable. Then you do gradual weight bearing. Complication is avascular necrosis, where you may have to do a total hip replacement. or irreducible for long period of time where you may have to do a pelvic support osteotomy plus minus excision of the head then we deal with the anterior dislocation there's a injury dashboard injury with flexed abducted externally rotated hip the head is lying below the acetabulum in front of the operator foramen the femoral artery may be pressed and there may be ischemia you must look for it again there is abduction external rotation and lengthening patient is lying on the floor under general anesthesia in this deformed position you give traction and you push the head back into the acetabulum then you extend and adduct and internally rotate and you immobilize in that position till the reduction becomes stable in 3 to 4 weeks followed by gradual weight bearing then there is the central dislocation here the acetabular floor is ruptured and the head goes internally morrises by trochanteric test and per rectal examination are positive you may pull the head out by a pin in the neck which has been screwed in so this can pull it out or you can give a lateral longitudinal traction where the resultant is in the direction of the spin in the direction of the neck so by these two you pull it out and you may prevent re dislocation by repairing the by repairing the medial wall by repairing the medial wall in avascular necrosis you do a core decompression in osteoarthritis you may have to do treat it by uh, stick in the opposite hand by physiotherapy by heat by analgesic and later you have to do a total hip replacement then septic arthritis of hip, hip there is bacteria there is maximum capacity there is pus in the joint and there is a flexion abduction flexion abduction external rotation deformity and because of abduction there is apparent lengthening you give rest and traction you aspirate give antibiotic according to culture and sensitivity you may have to really drain it and debride the joint if it is cured it is cured if there is a pathological posterior dislocation you treat by pelvic support osteotomy if there is a bony ankylosis in functional position you do nothing but if there is deformity which is unacceptable then you do a corrective osteotomy and if ground level activity is indicated you excise the head plus minus pelvic support osteotomy which we know as milch bachelor's operation in ankylosing spondylitis it's a young patient and the hip is ankylosed you do a hybrid total hip replacement where the femoral component is cemented but the acetabular component is uncemented because in an uncemented acetabular component the cup component which gets uh, uh, worn out can be easily replaced then in ankylosing spondylitis you control the disease activity and prevent limitation of movement by exercise and heat therapy
and you control this disease activity, you may need drugs. Then we deal with slipped femoral epiphysis, again a flexion, adduction external rotation problem. In the child, it could have been Perthes disease. In an adolescent, pre-puberty, pre hypogonadic boy, there is pain in limp with a flexion, adduction, external rotation deformity, not internal rotation. I will correct this. external rotation deformity with some amount of true shortening and some amount of true shortening it it can be acute but mostly it's chronic you diagnose is slipped femoral epiphysis or adolescent coxavera. So, if it was if it was in a child, you could have thought of Perthes disease clinically. Now it's in an adolescent pre puberty person, so you think of slipped femoral epiphysis. So if this is the growth plate, and you see that it has slipped, and the head is in the acetabulum, so the shaft is adducted. So there is adduction deformity because of this downward slip of the head downward slip of the head <coughs> then because of the backward slip there is a because of the backward slip there is a external rotation deformity so here you find that these are the this is the anastomosis at the back of the neck this one between the ascending branches of the medial and lateral circumflex humeral artery and from this side of the anastomosis running the anterior lateral epiphyseal vessels and on this side the posterior lateral epiphyseal. You find that as this head goes backwards the anti-epiphyseal vessels are stretched and now if it's an old case and you reduce this head the posterior will be stretched and the head will become avascular. So, when you are trying to reduce in an old case of slip femoral epiphysis, from this point you must remove this bone piece so that when the head is reduced, the posterior retinocular vessels are not stretched. This removing this part of the neck is called as trapezoid osteotomy. This is what has been explained. This is trapezoid osteotomy and this will prevent stretching of the posterior vessels, posterior retinocular vessels and will save the head from avascular necrosis. So trapezoid osteotomy of the neck. In a fresh case, you can reduce and pin and there will be no stretching of the posterior vessels and no avascularity. <coughs> then we deal with the ileosospasm. Iliosos in a fracture neck of femur will lead to a flexion, adduction, external rotation deformity. But if the neck of femur is intact, then it will lead to a flexion, adduction and internal rotation deformity. Why? Because this is the head, this is the neck, this is the this is where the iliosos is inserted. like this and the axis of the femur here you see the adductor tubercle okay femoral condyle so the axis of the rotation will pass from here behind the iliosos to the adductor tubercle therefore this whole thing will internally rotate if the neck is intact. Now, if the neck is broken, then this axis will become here and the, the muscle will start externally rotating. So, that's why in iliosospasm with an intact neck, there's internal rotation deformity and adduction leads to apparent shortening. 
Now this iliosospasm can be intraarticular because of TB stage 2. Here rotation is painful and we have already covered TB stage 2. In extraarticular where rotation is free, rotation free, there can be spasm because of appendicitis, because of tephilitis, which is cecum inflammation, because of lymphadenitis, usually filarial, and finally because of a cold abscess. Cold abscess falls in the field of orthopedics. So, here we will quickly understand this cold abscess. It is coming from the intervertebral joint, the intervertebral disc involved in tuberculosis and into the source. So this is the source of this cold abscess and let us understand this carefully. This is the body, this is the neural canal, this is the lamina, this is the spinous process, these are the transverse processes. From the tip of the spinous process, from the tip of the transverse process and from the anterior half of the transverse process, there are three layers of fascia which are called, which combine to form what is called as the thoracolumbar fascia, which is here. This is the thoracolumbar fascia. From thoracolumbar fascia arise the transversus abdominis, innermost, the internal oblique, then this is the fascia transversalis, this one. It is coming down like this. It encloses the abscess, goes back and closes the kidney where it is called as the gerota's fascia. Crosses the inferior vena cava and the aorta and goes to the opposite side. So here is the abscess. This muscle is external oblique. And on this side is the latissimus dorsi. Between the two is the lumbar triangle of petit. Triangle of petit. And the approach is you divide the skin subcutaneous tissue, go through the lumbar triangle of petit, divide the thoracolumbar lumbar fascia, and then you reach the cold abscess. And you evacuate it. So orthopedics, people should know how to evacuate a source abscess which can cause a ileosospasm and an extra articular reason of flexion, adduction, internal rotation, deformity. Then what is the difference between evacuation and drainage? So cold abscess is evacuated. First evacuation is anti-gravity. Then you go in a volvular way so that there is no sinus. This is called a Z pattern to ensure a volvular mechanism. Then you stitch a cold abscess to prevent a sinus. When you are draining a pus abscess, this is the pus abscess, you drain at the most prominent point. This is called as the Hilton's method of drainage. You make a stab incision, no volvular mechanism, and you leave the abscess open. So this is the difference between drainage and evacuation, which you are commonly asked.